It's a new day and a new year. Shout it out loud. Sing with the crowd. Celebrate, cause good things are coming. New opportunities are out. Well, hey, good morning. I'm uh, not feeling so good, so uh, today you're going to have to give me some grace. I didn't feel it would be appropriate to call one of my staff members on Saturday. Plus, they probably wouldn't answer the phone anyway, so I figured it's work day. Better show up and uh, get to work. But uh, really glad that you're here and really excited about this series uh, called The Best You. But before we get into that, I just uh, I want to... I want to invite all of you and all of you on the other side of that lens and all of you who are a part of our middle school and high school ministry called Pathway Students, everybody living in Appleton, if you're at home today or watching this later on this week, I want to invite you to something very special, a special event that's taking place on Friday, February 9th called Night to Shine at Liberty Hall. And here's what's so incredible about this event. You're not going to get anything at this event. (laughs) <laughs> you're not going to get a single thing, but here's what you're going to have the opportunity to do. You're going to have the opportunity to give something, some of the most valuable things, God's heart through your own heart, as you get to serve a very beautiful group of people, uh, uh, people with special needs, ages 14 and up. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw them a prom. I'm really excited about this. We're going to have the opportunity to throw them a prom with a red carpet entrance and paparazzi. There's going to be limousines. We're going to uh, roll out the, the royal treatment to them. We're going to make sure that they have corsages and boutonnieres. And, and we're going to have stations for makeup and hair. We're going to cater a meal. We're going to make sure that they're well taken care of. And uh, if you want to be a part of this incredible evening, make sure you sign up online or talk to somebody in the Missions Bay. Talk to somebody at Info later on after service because it's an incredible way for us uh, just to share God's love and uh, a- a- every guest at the end of the evening is going to receive a crown and a tiara. This is so cool. They're going to receive a crown and a tiara because uh, all of them are going to be kings and queens uh, for that particular evening. And this night isn't just for our treasured guests, but it's also for us to shine, for our church to shine, and ultimately for Christ's love to shine. So make sure you're part of that on uh, Friday, uh, February 9th. Uh, called Night to Shine. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you're excited about that. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. Really cool thing. That's why I love being a part of our church, because we get to do some really cool stuff like that, and uh, this is just a a neat opportunity for us, so make sure that you check that out and participate in that with us. All right, so also uh, today is part three of The Best You, and what I'm going to do at the end of the message today, I'm going to give you three questions. I'm going to give you three questions. You don't have to write them down. I've already done that for you. So these three questions, uh, what you do need to do, though, is download our mobile app. You can use these three questions uh, to process them with uh, your small group or perhaps with your spouse or somebody in your family or maybe in your chair time, your devotional time. These questions are going to be really important because I think they're going to make the difference in this series as you work with some of those questions and the content that we're going to talk about on the weekend. So let's do this. Let's uh, begin the way we began last weekend with this question. So what do you want? What do you want? What do you really want? As we get into this new year, another way that we could say this is, what are you chasing? Now, we said last weekend that this is a really tricky question. It's tricky because some of the things that we want, they run parallel to some other things that we want. I'll tell you one of the things that you want. You, you, want, you want your way. I want my way. We want what, what, what we want. I want that, and you want that, and we want that now. So on one hand, when we ask the question, 
what do you want, there are some things that are running in the background. There are some things that are driving our wants, whether it's a list of things or a relationship or a character quality. There's some things that are driving that. And what's driving that is that we want our way, we want what we want, and we want it now. And last week, as I said, I mentioned this is the problem. If we always get our way, we get in our way, and we lose our way. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, here's his question. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world? You could gain the whole world, Jesus says, yet, say that next word with me, forfeit your soul. Now, you have to understand that Jesus was a Jew, and when he speaks, he's speaking with the backdrop of a Jewish mindset and vocabulary. So the word in Hebrew for soul is nephesh. And this verse is so powerful because he's having this tension between the whole world, and he's saying you could have all of that, and yet you could forfeit your soul. The word soul there is your entire life. You think you gain something entirely, but really what you lose, you lose something entirely. You lose lose yourself. We said it this way last weekend that that if we get what we want now, in the immediate, in the temporal, in the here and now, we might not get what we really want later on. That's what Jesus is talking about. And then uh, we drove into something uh, even deeper. We drove into this. We we got to this statement. We said, um, basically, what we really want lives in a realm that we rarely explore. What we really want lives in a realm that we rarely explore. See, off to the peripheral, off to the the place that we can't see, in the shadows, in those deep waters, there's something that lives that we rarely explore, and those things are our values. A value is what is important to you. A value is something that you really hold deeply to. So, for example, you might say, well, I want to one day, I want to marry her. Right now, I'm dating. Well, that's great, but but why do you want to get married? Or you say, I want to be rich. Man, I hope you get rich. That's, that's incredible. But why do you want to get rich? What's the value that drives that? And it goes deeper than just our values. It goes down to our character, to who we are as an individual, as a person. That's what we're going to talk about next week. My point is this. My point is that what you value will determine what you chase. What you value will determine what you chase in life. And uh, uh, here's, here's the thing. The thing is, we'll never get what we really want until we discover what we really value. And no one, no one can figure this out for you. Your parents can't determine your values. Your friends, they can't determine your, they can influence, they can help shape. But at the end of the day, no preacher, no professor, no person except the person that's sitting in your seat can determine what you value, what you really are going to anchor your life to. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you, you know, you don't really believe in God, you're not a church girl, you're not a religious person. Here's the interesting thing. Regardless of what you think about Christianity, regardless of what you think about church, this is true for you. Discovering your value, what what matters to you is for every single person. Now, as a Christian, obviously, I believe that God created us to ask these value questions because he knew our heart and he knew that our heart and our minds and our lives would be driven by our values and his spirit. And if you want, if you want what God wants, watch out. Let me put it this way to you. I want what God wants. If God doesn't want it, I don't want any part of it. And I think that's true of you. I think you want what God wants, and if God doesn't want it, you don't want any part of it. Now, the tension, obviously, is trying to understand the distinction between what I want and what God wants. That's called knowing and understanding God's will. That's why last week we read this prayer together in Colossians 1.9. Here's the prayer. We continually ask God. Who do we ask? We ask God. Why do we ask God? For what? To fill you with the knowledge of his will through through all wisdom and understanding that who gives? That the Spirit gives. This is what Paul was talking about in Colossians. And 
The good news is that Jesus is our example. He's he's like the first in line when it comes to the will of the Father. In fact, he uses some really cool terminology. He says this in the Gospel of John chapter 4. He says, my food, look at this, look at this. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will, to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, having said all of that, this should be easy, right? I mean, this should be really easy. Just kind of like, you know, like download a book off of whatever onto your reader and read a couple things and write a couple things out. Just, you know, make up your values and live into your values. Like, just do it. I mean, it's not that hard, right? Well, it is really hard. In fact, it's terribly hard. And here's what I want to focus on today. I want to look at this problem. And the problem is this. Choosing what is valuable is unnatural. Choosing what is valuable to you and me, it is very unnatural. See, the reason that this is so difficult isn't because you lack discipline. The the, the reason this is so difficult to choose what is valuable is not simply that, that you don't have enough information. The reason that this is so difficult for you and me to choose what is valuable is because there's this internal conflict going on inside of us every minute of every single day. And most people, most people never break through the natural to embrace what is valuable. But when they do, their lives their entire lives completely change. And I want that for you. I want you to break through the natural to embrace, to embrace what is valuable to you and ultimately what is valuable to God. In fact, I think the person who best describes this is Paul. Paul, uh, he wrote half of the New Testament, and Paul, when he started out in his journey, he hated Christians. In fact, he was trying to put the, the church out of business in the first century. And then he became a Jesus follower, and he wrote a bunch of letters to, to Christians. Now, one of the letters that he wrote, uh, some scholars believe that he had not even visited this area At the time of him penning and writing this letter, he wrote a letter to the people, to the Christians in Rome. Now, you got to understand in the first century, if you were a believer and you lived in Rome, this was a pretty risky proposition. It was a Greek uh, dominated society. There weren't a lot of Jewish uh, monotheistic believers in that area. But by the time of mid 40s to like early 50s AD, what is fascinating is that there are hundreds of Christians. The gospel had spread to Rome, and there's probably about a dozen to 15 house churches. And so what Paul does is he writes this letter that circulates to these house churches. And, and he puts this conflict. He puts this conflict that we all experience in terms that we can all understand. In fact, the the very first part of the first verse that I'm going to put on the screen that we're going to look at in Romans chapter 7 could be a life verse for you. Do you know what a life verse is? Life verse is kind of, uh, if you're not a Christian, it's it's kind of one of the goofy things we do as Christians. It's, It's not that it's goofy. It's not a bad thing. I have a life verse. But it's a hard thing. Because we as Christians, we try to take all the books of the Bible, all 66 and all the chapters and all the verses, and we try to identify one verse. And sometimes that can be a tough question to answer. So if you're looking for a life verse and somebody says, you know, what's your life verse? I'm going to give you a life verse. Are you ready? Here we go. Romans chapter 7. I do not understand what I do. That is a fantastic life verse. Like, if you need a life verse, this is what you, you, in fact, you could take that little verse and you could put it on your mirror. Or you could engrave it and you could put it at the entrance of your doorway. When somebody walks into your house, you could say, I do not understand what I do. Hmm, that's interesting. You say, yep, that's kind of my life verse. I have no idea what I'm doing. Maybe put that uh, on your desk and your boss walks in and say, wow, I'm glad your faith is really helping you with your job. You don't understand <laughs> what you do. But, but isn't that true? I mean, can't you relate to what Paul is saying? In fact, I bet every one of you could stand up and share a story that you don't really understand what what you're doing sometimes. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about this internal conflict. He's talking about things that we we don't understand. Now, if you don't like the Bible or you haven't read much of it, you know this part is true. Because not only could you share a story about it, you could share a story about it that didn't happen five years ago, but happened five days ago. You could share a story where you think, oh, my word, why did I do that? 
Like you looked at yourself in the mirror and you said this, I'm not calling you this, you called yourself this. You were like, you idiot, why did I sleep in? Why did I eat that? Why did I text that? Why did I go there? Why did I do that? I do not understand what I do. Haven't you ever done this? I have. Like I I just don't understand why I did what I just did. And we're going to go deeper, but just think about that thought. Why don't you do what you want to do? Think about that. Why don't you do what you want to do? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with us? It's kind of a tension. It's this internal conflict. The point of today's message is that there's a conflict between what you value and your human nature what you chase after, what you determine to choose. This is a big deal. And it's not just about getting some more information. It's not more discipline. It goes way deeper than this. Listen to what Paul says. He says this in the second half of verse 15. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Again, this is so transparent, right? Paul says, man, I I have some desires. I want to do But the things that I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And you thought last week and I had some tongue twisters. Listen to what Paul writes here in 715. I mean, he's all over. Paul is saying, I understand what it is like to do things that I don't like to do. In fact, I I really want some things, but I always settle for things that are less than what I really want. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, like, I, I just, I settle. And I end up hating, I end up hating the things that I end up doing. Paul understands this so well that he, he knows that sometimes not only do we begin to hate the things that we do, he knows that we're only a half inch away of hating ourselves. And if I'm going to be super candid with some of you here this weekend, maybe you're in a place where you're at a place where you hate you. You hate the person that's in the mirror because it's no longer about the things that you do. It's about who you are. And and maybe you're at a place where the pain is so great and life is kind of closing in and you just, you want to let go. You're on a path of self-destruction. You're at a place where you just want to give up. You want to give in because you hate you. If you're at that place and maybe you're thinking about a plan or you have some note that's written out or maybe you're at a place because it's real, right? We live in Northeast Wisconsin. This is one of the few locations that I've ever lived that I've seen so much depression. It's a seasonal thing. It can be a mixture of medication. It can be some poor choices. And soon you can find yourself in a place where you, you want to just self-destruct. And I'm here just to let you know that God has never, he never knit you together in your mother's womb for you to self-destruct and to take your life. That's not God's plan for you. Taking your life is never the answer. And we're here to help you. We want to listen, reach out, talk to somebody. If you're a part of our faith family, you're a believer and you know somebody is struggling with depression, will you get up and will you go talk to them? Put your arm around them, say, there's a group, there's a church, there's somebody that wants to listen. There is is a God and he is the God and he loves you. Maybe you're here today and you're a small group leader or care provider. You want some more information on this? On the back of your program, there's a a powerful workshop that's coming up in our community called The The Truth About Faith and Suicide. I would encourage you to check that out and uh, read some more information, gather some more things as you reach out to people who who are hurting. Let's go on to see what Paul says. He says this. He says, and if I do what I do not want to do, there's our word, I agree that the law is good. Now, what's Paul talking about? Well, Paul's a Pharisee. Uh, Paul, Paul's a Pharisee, and a Pharisee, uh, their whole goal in life was to be a great law keeper. And so when you read the, law, the word law there, it's referencing the Old Testament law. It's very complicated. Paul was saying, I'm a, I was a law keeper. In fact, Paul would later write in one of his books in Philippians, he would say, I was the best of the best. Like, I was... I was I was spotless when it came to keeping the law, but I tried so hard, and although I kept a lot of the laws, I could just never pull it off. I could never do it perfectly right. 
I just never felt like I was close to God, yet I knew the law was given by, by God, but there was this internal tension inside of me, and I just couldn't get it right. Now, today, we, we don't live under the Old Testament law, but, but we have a law. It's this internal moral code, this, this code of ethics of between what is right and wrong, and, and maybe you don't believe in right and wrong, but I guarantee you, you believe that you want other people to do right by you, Right? Because if you drive on the 41 today and somebody cuts you off, you're going to be like, that was wrong, (laughs) right? So you you know what's right and wrong. And deep down inside, we all want people to do us the right way. Just like deep down inside, all of us know what is right and wrong, and we live with this. And no matter how well you try to live on the side of right and do what is right, you know you can't fully pull it off. And then you take that kind of uh, lifestyle and you apply that to to faith or to God. And you just try to do what is right. I'm just going to do what is right. I'm just going to persevere. I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Do you know what that is? You're trying to earn your way to God. Do you know what we call that? We call that religion. We call that a set of right and wrongs, do's and don'ts. And if I can just do good enough, God will love me enough. There is nothing that you can do for God to love you any more or any less. God loves you completely. All he asks you to do is to receive his new life in Christ. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus, what Jesus did, he was always pointing people beyond what they wanted initially to what they wanted ultimately. From the, from the initial to the ultimate. Jesus was always pointing people beyond what they initially wanted to say, you know what you ultimately want? You want to be known and to be loved by the creator. That's why suicide is always off the table if you are created by God. And all of you, last time I checked, were created by God. That's what Paul says. Paul says, like, like I, I know this tension. I know this tension so well, and I know I couldn't earn it. I know I couldn't fulfill it. He said, I agree that the law is good. It wasn't that Paul was a bad person. It was, it was the fact that Paul was so ridiculously good. And he still says, I agree with the law that I am a law breaker. In fact, he goes on to say this. Look at the next verse. He says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is, say that next word with me, sin, living in me. Now, we don't talk about that word a lot, sin, but, but Paul says there's a sin problem. Like There's a sin problem inside of us. And that doesn't mean that there's not good people who don't know God. That, that, that doesn't mean that people can't do good things, but they can never save themselves apart from the grace of God. They never can resolve the sin problem, this internal conflict without an internal transformation. That's what Paul is saying. He goes on and he says this, uh, for, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. There's the tension, the conflict. For I have the desire. I have the want to. I want to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, here's Paul, a Pharisee, the best of the best, top of his class. He did everything to like the, 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 the best. And he said, I can't carry out the desire that I have inside of me. Why? Because in our human nature, we are totally fallen. In fact, the, the Protestant reformers, would uh, they term the, the, the phrase in the 16th century as completely total depravity. One uh, scholar, a longtime professor at Trinity Seminary, Seminary in Chicago, Wayne Grudem, said this, it is not just that some parts of us are sinful and others are pure. Rather, every part is affected by sin. And this is what he says. Our intellects, our emotions, and desires, our hearts, our goals, our, and our motives, and even our physical bodies. Every part of you and every part of me is impacted by sin, and we know it. We know that we're fallen. We know that there's this internal conflict, and we know that we can't choose, that choosing what is valuable is totally unnatural to us. No matter how much information, no matter how much discipline we have, we know that we don't choose what is valuable because it is unnatural to us. He wraps up his little passage here in verse 19. This is what Paul says. He says, For 
I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. I'm glad you came Sunday morning to church. I know you feel really warm inside that we got to talk about this. But you know what? You should feel encouraged by the fact that the Apostle Paul, the author of half of the New Testament, he knows what you and I live with. (laughs) In fact, I believe that when Paul wrote these words in Romans 7, he was referencing and speaking of his life before he met Christ. I think he was talking about this internal conflict before he met Jesus and the power that had set him free. And I appreciate his candor in this because when I read Paul and when I talk to people who perhaps are a couple steps away from God or maybe they're far from God, and I start reading Romans 7 and sharing some of these passages, you might not be a Bible reader. You you might not know a lot of the scripture, but you can relate to Paul, can't you? I mean, you start talking about Jesus, and you're like, Jesus, that's like God's son. But Paul, this guy, he was like feet to the ground. I understand. Doing the things that I don't want to do and the things that I hate, I do. I get this guy. You know why you get this guy? Because he gets your human nature. He gets my human nature. Our nature is not grace-filled. Our nature, by nature, we are not forgiving. By nature, we're not inherently good. By nature, if our nature is left unchecked and it can run rampant with no outside restrictors or anything prohibiting our desires and appetites, you know what our nature devolves into? Let me tell you, lying, cheating, racism or racist thoughts, revenge. Like that's nature. I mean, nature, just just. Creation in general. Oh, people say, oh, I I go out to creation, and creation is so beautiful. Yeah, it is, until you get up close, and then you get up close, and you see creation. It is kind of like an unforgiving thing. It can be cold. Animals die. They rot. They attack each other. They kill each other. Our human nature is like that. In fact, Paul, in another letter that he wrote to the church at Colossae, he talks about what our human nature looks like. He says this in verse 5 of chapter 3 of Colossians. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Why does he say put to death? Because he knows that the earthly nature isn't a good thing. He says, uh, this is what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Do you know what idolatry is? It's putting things before people. It's saying to people, oh, yeah, you can borrow this because I have the new one of this. It's taking those things and it's putting them before people and ultimately it's putting it before those things before God. In another book, uh, Paul talks about, he couples this idea of idolatry, he puts it with sorcery. Do you know what sorcery is? Sorcery means trying to control people. Ever met a person who was trying to manipulate and control you? A controlling friend, a parent, a controlling employee, somebody controlling you with their words, and they're playing head games? That's what human nature is. It's sorcery. It's trying to control people. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, man, this is like, ooh, listen to this next verse. This is what Paul says, verse 6. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. When was the last time you heard this verse in church? That was a joke. (laughs) We don't really talk about the wrath of God. I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable But unless I tell you the truth, you're not going to know the power of the gospel. If we try to minimize the sin problem, what we end up doing is sucking the life out of the cross and the grace of God. Because what Jesus does is he intercepts the wrath of God, and he puts it on his shoulders. This is the good news. Like, I don't care what football team you root for. I know you're all Packers fans, and you know I'm a Bears fan. But can we agree on the fact that when somebody is driving against your favorite football team and your defender intercepts the pass, we all go nuts, right? When Jesus intercepted the wrath of God, 
we can all say, hooray, Jesus, because you took what I deserved upon yourself so I could get the best version of myself under the rule and the reign of God, the blessing of God called his grace. I could get a new nature, a new me, a new you. This is why I love, I want to end the message with this last verse. This is why I love what he says in verse 7. Next week we'll look at, uh, we'll look at 8 and 9 and 10. But I love how he ends this passage. This is what Paul says in verse 7. He says this. He says, you, say this uh, two words with me. You, uh, say it again with me. You, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you used to walk in these ways. Used to. I used to. Now, that doesn't mean you're perfect. That doesn't mean that you choose to go back to those ways. But the curse, the bondage, the internal conflict is resolved. The sin problem is taken care of because of what Christ has done on the cross and by you placing your faith and your belief and your hope in what Jesus has done. You used to walk in these ways. In the life you, say that word with me, once lived. Oh, now that's a life verse. I used to be this way. I used to act this way. I used to be an angry person. I used to hit her. I used to say those things. I used to use those things. I used to watch those things. I, but now, but now, but now I'm different. Now I'm changed. And it all comes down to this one thing. What do you value? Because what you value will determine what you chase. What do you chase? What are you chasing this new year? What are you giving your life to? What are you saying that this is the most important thing? I'm going to devote myself to it. Because whatever you value is what you chase. And what you chase is what you make priority. It's what you give your resources to. It's what you give your mental thought, your energy. This whole thing has to become your life. And this whole thing is God himself. What you value is what you will chase. It determines what you will chase. So, what are you chasing? What are you chasing?